Mobile World Congress, a fortnight of madness, a week of pre-announcements and then the show itself, so much to cover, but here are the highlights for me. I've omitted some of the more niche manufacturers, many of whom announced hardware that's not going to be available here for the best part of a year. How could I not love Nokia's 808 PureView, a final hurrah for Symbian and an awesome slice of camera tech in a phone? The headline figure of 41 megapixels is completely and utterly widely misunderstood though. What matters here is the 1 over 1.2 inch sensor, two and a half times the size of that of the N8, plus oversampling, letting the massive sensor array produce perfect 3, 5 or 8 megapixel images or up to three times zooming without any loss of detail. Plus double power Xenon flash and LED for torch mode. It's the fastest Symbian phone ever to at 1.3 gigahertz with two GPUs plus the E7's excellent, if a little blocky, four inch CBD AMOLED screen. And did I mention that you can change the battery? Yay! Nokia were listening to me, I tell you. Staying with Nokia for a moment, the Lumia 610 is the first Tango-powered Windows phone targeted towards the lower end of the market. With just 256 megabytes of RAM and Windows Phone Tango coming soon that supports this lower memory and processor specs, the Lumia 610 will retail for just €189 Euros all in. Has the usual Nokia Drive, Nokia Maps, Nokia Music, plus Nokia Reading, the new text and audiobook hub, along with Nokia Transport, the new public transport navigation and scheduling service. The screen's 3.7-inch L LCD and all specs are utterly unremarkable, but everyone who's handled the 610 at the show has come away very impressed. There's also the impressive little Asher 302, a full smartphone light device at under €100 Euros all in. It's the classic QWERTY candy bar form factor with Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter and Microsoft Exchange email all built in out of the box. The Huawei Ascend D Quad. As it sounds, as a quad-core processor with clock speed up to 1.5 GHz. has a 4.5-inch IPS display with 720p resolution, pentaband radios, a 2,500 mAh battery, plus the usual top-end specs, including an 8-megapixel camera. Importantly, it'll launch with Android 4. HTC is never one to be left out at MWC, launching a new range of devices, the One X, the One S and the One V, in descending order of size. They're all unibody designs here, showing the top-end One X, which has a staggering 1.5GHz Super 4 Plus 1 quad-core processor, allied to a 4.7-inch 720p LCD screen. The One X and its sister models all run Android 4 with HTC Sense 4, apparently. HTC has always loved its extra UI layers. One big new feature is being able to snap photos during video capture, so in theory, you never again have to make the do I shoot a video or take some snaps decision. The One S is smaller and thinner at under 8 mils thick with a 4.3 inch QHD screen and dual core processor. Like the other models, it features the big camera improvements and NFC. Meanwhile, the One V is the new baby of the bunch with 3.7 inch WVGA screen that is, quote, optically laminated, apparently. Kind of like Nokia's clear black display. I've already reported on the Sony Xperia S. It now has two little sisters. The aluminium unibody Xperia P runs the old Android 2.3, has a 1 gig dual core processor and a 4 inch QHD screen with quote white magic display, essentially adding an extra high brightness white LED pixel besides each RGB group to help black and white contrast when the phone is outdoors in the sun. There's also NFC of course, plus the now familiar translucent LED control strip. The Xperia U has lower specs all round and is aimed at the mid-tier, plus you get to take off and swap coloured end caps, apparently. Yes. Uh, moving on, Panasonic is back. The Aluga, <laughs> pretentiously standing for elegant, user-oriented gateway, is a gorgeous-looking Android device with mil-spec waterproofing, dust resistance and a 4.3-inch QHD screen. It's also very light at only 103 grams and very thin at less than 8 mil. Under the hood, there's NFC, a 1 gig dual core processor, 1 gig of RAM, and the other usual top end specs. Very nice, though I was cross at seeing yet another Android front end. Still, Android 4 is coming to the Aluga in a few months. No, no, this isn't the Lumia 800 from Nokia. It's actually its predecessor, and it runs an OS that you almost certainly won't have seen before. You may remember the old N900 QWERTY running MIMO, this is effectively the latest evolution with some of Intel's 2010 MIGO input. Officially, the N9 runs MIGO Harmattan, somewhat confusingly, though the OS doesn't actually make much difference in the long run since the N9 was a one-off product, even when it was announced. If you're looking for a finished product with a fully rounded ecosystem, if you're looking for every app under the sun to be available, if you're looking for a device which will be officially supported for years, if you're looking for something which just works, uh, don't get this. 
go get an iPhone or similar. The N9 completely unashamedly is a true geek's smartphone. Stephen Quinn currently sent this review unit over and in my initial tests I'd say that the OS and core apps are about 80% finished. Uh, three days ago a big new OS release PR 1.2 arrived over the air whereupon I had to recheck everything and uh, rewrite my review notes. I'd say that the N9 is 95% there now. Will it ever reach 100%? Uh, probably not. But then that's half the fun. As a geek you'd buy the N9 because you want the excitement of wondering what will be added next month, what core ecosystem apps will finally arrive, which patches and hacks come out of the Nokia community. There's always something to add, something to update, something to look forward to. An example, I was bemoaning the lack of a camera shutter key here on the N9, nothing at all. I look in the Nokia store and there's a utility to remap the volume up key to launch the camera and take photos. Good stuff. Like the Lumia 800 which followed it, the N9 is unibody polycarbonate, but this time with a 3.9 inch clear black display. It's a MOLED with Gorilla Glass 854 by 480 resolution, making by my calculations the highest ever resolution in any Nokia device. It's an elegant design too with ports and slots hidden under flaps here at the top and only three buttons here on the right, the aforementioned volume up, volume down and key lock. Speaker on the bottom and a somewhat horribly exposed 8 megapixel camera on the back with dual LED flash. And that's your lot. It does feel great in the hand though with the rather unique swipe UI working brilliantly with the convex glass. Swiping from side to side to switch apps feels utterly natural. Yes, swiping from side to side. There's no menu button, no back or home, no anything. Instead, there are just three main views that you can cycle through. Firstly, the app launcher looking suspiciously here like uh, Symbian Bell, Nokia is doing a great job of converging the icon style and UI elements between its different OSs. Then the uh, multitasking view, just tap the app you want to switch to, uh, and notifications pane. The latter is interesting, offering confirmation of date and time, current weather, which you can see out of the window, to be fair, but uh, tapping on this does give you an AccuWeather forecast in detail, shown here. Uh, notifications from various services and applications, including email, tap to read and reply, plus a feed of your updates from all your social services. And you can do this swipe from anywhere in the UI, which is just very clever. A swipe down the screen closes the current app, and a swipe up brings up the relevant home screen that you were last on. Love it. Applications are familiar, yet not quite the same. Heavy elements of Nokia's Symbian apps with other influences creeping in. There's Nokia Maps and Nokia Drive starring as they do on Symbian and Windows Phone, plus there's Nokia Store and a decent set of bundled applications, including native, Facebook, Twitter and Skype applications. None of these will set the world alight and there's no Skype video calling yet, but they're a great start. And Twitter in particular, has a number of super alternatives in the Nokia store already. There's the NFC enabled 20 level version of Angry Birds plus full versions of Galaxy on Fire 2, Need for Speed Shift and Real Golf. There's a YouTube icon too but it sadly only goes to the mobile website. Workable but hardly an elegant client. Again third party software comes to the rescue. <laughs> Talking of videos I was disappointed by the built-in video player. It seems the OS and graphic chip aren't up to the job of anything but very basic and patchy 720p support, meaning that almost all my test videos would have to be transcoded down to a lower resolution in order to be played. You can't play these types of files on this device. Music's great, mind you. Very, very good quality. If you bring along your own in-ear multimedia headphones, you'll hate the supplied cheap controlless outer ear ones. Other notable apps include a utility for Wi-Fi tethering and a document viewer. Powering all of this is a one gigahertz processor and one gigabyte of RAM, easily enough to keep this Linux-based OS chugging along. Though even with the latest update, I did experience a number of glitches and blank screens, plus a nasty moment when I thought I'd broken it. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> Again, all part of the not completed yet excitement for the hardened phone show viewer. Also inside the N9 is either 16 gigabyte or here, has 64 gigabytes of flash memory with no expansion, but you don't need it, I guess, with 64. An NFC transceiver, naturally, plus a sealed 1450 milliamp hour battery. Non-user replaceable batteries are a big no-no with me at the moment, and I'll rant about that in a future show. Being AMOLED and Nokia, there's the familiar always lit up screensaver here with some useful and some not so useful icons. 
The question marks almost certainly refer to the way the review Pentaband N9 categorically refused to work with my GIFGAF micro SIM card, despite it working perfectly in every other phone here. Stephen supplying it had no such issues, so, well, I oh well, just one more tech mystery to solve. The N9's camera was much touted at launch with genuine wider 16.9 window onto the sensor, and indeed photos are pretty decent, though a long way from N8 quality. You have to capture via an on-screen icon though. I really missed a proper camera shutter button. And macro photos were almost impossible to take. The macro setting here in the settings just doesn't work. <laughs> There's a typically weedy dual LED flash. Thankfully, video is 720p and great, as seen here with continuous autofocus plus stereo audio. Web browsing on the N9 is arguably elegant, with new windows appearing as separate browser instances and available via the multitasking window. Uh, text can be copied iPhone style by adjusting markers on screen. There's no flash support, not that I miss this much. One oddity is I'm used to swiping around web pages on uh, touchscreen phones. Uh, try that with too much flair here and you end up activating the built-in swipe UI gestures, erroneously. Along the same lines, do the standard industry downswipe to get notifications and you end up closing the web browser. <laughs> Your app just got closed down. Swipe with care, folks, whichever application you're in. As a geek myself, I found it impossible to dislike the N9, though. It's a serious investment into something whose future you can enjoy helping shape. Things are appearing all the time. Um, landscape mode for many applications just arrived in the recent update three days ago. Just arrived. <laughs> kind of like a DIY smartphone for the community. The uh, Nokia community is already running at some pace supporting this device, but I did see some brave soul even porting Android ice cream sandwich to it. Wow. Personally, the sealed battery and the use of an OS with even less developer support than Symbian are a little off-putting. But even so, I was absolutely able to understand the enthusiasm this lovely slice of polycarbonate has generated, and I'll be sad having to send it back shortly.